Hey everyone, it is episode 40 of Ep Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and it looks like it's April 24th, the premiere of Game of Thrones, which we'll be talking about, I'm sure, for <laughs> hopefully, hopefully the whole episode. This is Laurel Black. Hi. And Ben Charles is over there in Florida. Hi, everybody. And sitting next to Megan Arns is our guest today, Michael Burrett. If you don't know who Michael Burrett is, then I don't know if you know what percussion is. And uh, Yeah, so anyway, one of the biggest names right now, the professor of percussion at uh, Eastman, uh, composer, Malatek artist, a uh, huge, huge person in our field. So uh, welcome over there in Missouri, Megan and Michael Burrett. Thank you. Nice to be here. Hey, so, and what are you doing there right now? And I saw a, a flyer for yourself and uh, I think Rich Redmond, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a day of percussion this weekend here, and uh, Megan put together, uh, along with the other officers in the state, um, like an all star percussion group, a college group. So I, you know, rehearsed them and played with them and spent a couple of days and did a concert. It was a really terrific experience. It was great. Wow, very cool. And are you doing anything in particular tonight on TV or HBO or anything? No. Am I doing anything on TV or HBO tonight? Yeah. yeah my, my wife will probably have me watching it. <laughs> one well, one of our... You know, actually, I'm at a hotel in St. Louis, but I've, I brought my HBO Go. You, know what I'm you did? So, yes, I have my iPad, so we're set. We're locked and loaded. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're, we're having a viewing party tonight to a mm -hmm. colleague of ours, uh, so a bunch of us are getting together. So anyway, this is actually pertinent to one of the Facebook questions. Our friend Sean Connors has asked... Michael oh, <laughs> so, so, so let me just let me just back up real quickly. Uh, uh, Mr. Burt and I were doing the Atlanta snare drum competition together that Tom Sherwood hosts, and I forget we were walking from point A to point B together as a group, and I started humming the tune. And Mike, I don't know if you remember this, but you jumped right in and finished, and you were like, "Oh, you like the show?" And da, da, da. And, and I think back then this was still season one or two, so. It hadn't quite caught the fire of popularity yet, so I don't know. To find someone who's like, "Oh, you watched the show too," it was it was really fun. I don't know if you remember that. Good bonding experience. Yes, yes. It was. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, do you do you think Jon Snow's dead? Uh, I don't know. I think he's. I guess I'm gonna guess that he's not dead, or he's gonna come back in some new form or something. Yeah. You know? You know, right, yeah. It doesn't matter if he's dead because it's Game of Thrones. It doesn't That's a good matter. Point. <laughs> he right, will come right. back if he's not. If he's not dead now, he will be dead later. That's <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I hope he's not dead because he was one of the guys I like the most. But that show, they just, I mean, like, no, no one's safe. You know, I'm glad I'm not on that show. I, you know, any minute now you can go away, even though you think you're the star, right? You'd be in trouble. You know? would be, yeah, we'd be goners. Uh, I, 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 have no, I think in the books he will be dead. I don't know what the show is going to do, but I think you're right. They will bring him back somehow. Um, I have no and, idea who you're talking about. I know, I know. I'm so excited. To, <laughs> I've got this thing. Look, Mike, Mike Bird and I are so alike. Look at you guys. You guys have, like, no idea what we're even talking about. <laughs> I'm, I'm out. <laughs> talking about Star Trek again. Oh, Star Trek's good too. I can go into Star Trek if you like. That's another question. Yeah, right. Well, Sean, Sean did ask about Star Trek as well, but I vetoed those questions. Um, <laughs> we talked about that last podcast. How about a more just general question from um, Ted Jackson? He says, hey, Professor Burrett, with an exclamation point, uh, with everything you do, how does it all bring you joy in different ways, teaching, performing, composing, etc.? Wow. Well, uh, how does it bring me joy in different ways? Um, yeah, I mean, actually, I think it's interesting because uh, Megan and I were talking about this a little bit yesterday, and, and with my student, Drew Warden, who's here in town, about how um, I don't personally, and I, and I think we share this, I don't, I don't think I'd be happy doing only one of those areas because they feed each other, you know what I mean, in a, in a sense, you know. So, like, for me, especially the teaching and performing is such a symbiotic uh, relationship for me, you know. Um, I would never want to be someone who was just outperforming, or you know. And I think if I was just teaching and I didn't have that artistic outlet or that to feed me, I don't think I'd be as good a teacher, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it, they they both bring me joy in different ways because, um, well, maybe in similar ways, but um, uh, I kind of need I need it's almost like I need I need some protein, but I also need you know I need my veggies and I need you know it's kind of like works together in the food groups for me, I guess. Can't function without one. Yeah, I don't, think, I don't think I could in that react way. So, to each other. Um, yeah, and I like it. It's, you know, there are seasons where there, things are more 
focused in the teaching area because it's a crazy time in school or, or I'm doing more traveling or I got a piece I got to write up for you and how that is Casey I got to get this done so all of a sudden you're having a period of time where you're kind of just you know focusing on a, trying to be creative in that way but I kind of I like I like that you know I like like having all those balls in the air you know or my friend Anders Oster always says having like you know plates spinning on sticks and running out of the room you know mm -hmm. trying to keep them spinning so um, so it kind of works for me you know we we mentioned it before. Um, it, it came from someone's Facebook question about uh, be, being successful or time management or something. And I know I pointed out a lot of the successful people I know. They just seem like they don't stop moving. And I, from my interactions with you, you seem like one of those people. I mean, you're even right now you're energized and energetic for the podcast, and you know, um, <laughs> you, you never seem like you're energy. Donuts, level. donuts and coffee are kicking in, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, my grandmother used to always say when I was a kid, she had this mic. She's a great person. She said, Michael, be still. It was so difficult for me. You know, it was like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, funny. Yeah, it was very funny, actually. But, um, yeah, I think... Um, I, I remember I took a sabbatical a couple of years ago. First one I took in, after 30 years of college teaching. So it was really cool. First of all, it was weird to, like, wake up in the morning and try to decide whether I should, like watch Netflix or practice, you know, it was like, you know, what, what can I, I can have these options to actually like sit on the couch or, you know, and I didn't like that so much, you know, and I kind of missed being at school. And I think in, in general, my wife would tell you I wasn't as happy because I had more time to do things. So I think when I, when my time is filled up, you know, like, um, I think you're right. I think I'm one of those people, I'm sure you are too, where it's just, you know, I need to, I need to have my time filled up and it keeps me on track and it keeps me energized and, and, uh, productive that way so sure. Yeah, sure sure hey well I would like to go ahead and move to a, a cool little thing I bumped into actually on a plane I don't know if you guys ever read those horrible sky magazines in the in the front <laughs> only when I forget my crosswords right but well, I actually I actually ran into a, a legitimate like article in there and I I chased it down a little bit and found some really interesting things, so I wanted to share it with you guys. And I want to start with just a question. And the question is, do you guys know what Claire de Lune, uh, Mickey Hart, and the CERN Large Hydron Collider have in common? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I feel they all appear in one of those terrible airline magazines. <laughs> I this article. I know exactly what article you're talking about. No way. Cool. Tell us. But I, I skimmed it. I don't even remember. I was like half asleep. But it was in American Airlines, right? On the American. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, okay. yeah. Wow, awesome. that's hilarious. I just saw that. No, that's that's great. I, I'm so happy Nothing about, about that. So, so what audio. am I? Do you know what I'm about to cover? I think so. Something about preserving audio or something. Yeah, that's right, dude. Way to go, Megan. That's Megan crazy. Megan. Wow. Can you just can you just give ben her? Miles. Can you, she just have her DMA now? Yeah. Ooh, yeah, sure. Done. That's good, yeah. Good job. Ooh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> that. So, so that that's right. Happened. They all have something to do with recovering old, unplayable recordings, uh, and these are some of the oldest recordings, and in fact, the oldest recording: uh, wax cylinder, glass, tin foil, and uh, vinyl records. So Mickey Hart, who I think we all probably know, percussionist, musicologist, and famous drummer of the Grateful Dead. Grateful Dead, and ethnomusicologist. And ethnomusicologist. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so he's responsible for collecting many original historic recordings and archiving them in the Library of Congress. Um, a great many of these recordings have been sitting silently over the years, unable to be played back due to their poor condition. They're broken, too worn out, or too deteriorated to play back. So they're basically just been sitting there in the Library of Congress and they're at risk to be played. So if you play them, they're going to be destroyed, that, or they're just already destroyed and are completely useless. So Carl Haber is a senior physicist at the U.S. Energy Berkeley Lab and 2013 MacArthur Fellow. Berkeley Lab is a U.S. Department of Energy National Laboratory dedicated to bringing science solutions to the world. Carl Haber and his colleagues build the 3D imaging technology used at the CERN Laboratory Large Hydron Collider. And this is the stuff that detects and decodes particle collisions. So it's a camera that does 3D imaging of the particle collisions and um, reconstructs that data and helps interpret that data. This is the same imaging technology that took part in the recent observation of the Higgs boson. 
Um, so Haber used the same imaging technology to recover damaged, unplayable audio recordings. The cameras capture the recordings in great detail, both laterally and vertically. So uh, a record is a lateral recording, because the needle moves and reads side to side, but old, say, wax cylinder recordings and maybe tinfoil recordings. I'm not sure about tinfoil recordings, but wax definitely. It's a vertical recording because it rolls and the needle moves up and down along it. So there's this extra dimension that you wouldn't be able to interpret with just a regular camera. You need this 3D imaging camera, um, or at least that's how I understood it. Let's see. So the highly detailed gigapixel image data is sent to a computer for image processing. It is mathematically reconstructed to create and generate an audio realization. This system is called IRENE, which stands for Image, Restore, Erase Noise, etc. So Image, Restore, Erase Noise, etc. IRENE has recovered the oldest voice recording known, as well as recordings from 1877 to 1888, known as the Silent Decade, due to the high number of unplayable tinfoil recordings of that time. Huh. So, what do you guys think, or sorry, what famous scientist is credited for making the first audio recording? Real quick, I, I just had a quick question with this. Have, like, have you heard these recordings? Like, what's the, like, what's the fidelity, like, on these recordings? It's pretty, it's pretty heinous, um, and the speeds are a little weird, which I'll mention in just a minute. Um, I think the race noise part is a big, yeah, important part of Irene because a lot of them are just so dirty yeah. and scratchy sounding. So, and, and you you can go look these up. You can find these on on YouTube. You look up uh, first recording ever. You'll you'll find some of these. But um, imagine a really scratchy record sound, and then turn the volume up on the scratches and okay. multiply how many scratches and pops you're hearing and then turn the volume down on what you're supposed to hear, and yeah. I think that resembles it. And it's like listening to like a terrible AM radio station, basically. <laughs> yeah, basi yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Um, so what scientist do you guys think is credited for making the first audio recording? They, they won't say. Okay. I want to yeah, be Tesla, just a guess. Right, right, so, so, so I think... Okay, so here we go. Thomas Edison created the phonograph in 1877, which can record and play back sound. So that's the amazing thing about Edison's thing is it was meant to play back. And when we think of recordings today, we don't even think, oh yeah, well you could record it and not have it be played back. It's still recorded. That's a whole nother mechanic. Yeah. Uh, but we don't even think, well, it's, of course, it's not even valuable if you can't yeah. play it back. But before Edison, in 1853, a guy named Edmund Leon Scott de Martinville was inspired by new developments in photography and invented the fun autograph. So not with sound he was inspired, but with photography. This machine was designed only to, uh, let's see, this machine was designed only to image sound and not play it back. The oldest recording known is that of Scott de Martinville singing a tune into his phonograph in 1860. The recording was originally thought to be 10 seconds of a young girl or boy singing, but with proper speed adjustment, it was revealed to be 20 seconds of a man thought to be Scott de Martinville singing the traditional folk song uh, Claire de Lune. So, not the WC Claire de Lune, but the folk song. So, Irene has managed to recover even this recording, which was never even intended to play back, um, which is really amazing that it was able to piece that together. So uh, that's kind of the end of what I wanted to tell you, and I just have a few images I want to try to share, because I want to get better at screen sharing on the podcast. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so I hope you guys are all looking at a picture of a record right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a that's just a cracked vinyl record, and w what the thing does is it takes these images that look something like this, and he of course puts them into a computer mathematically, and it spits out um, a formula to to read and decode and fix these things, so you can play the records back without ever actually playing them. So you never have to do anything physical to them other than look at wow. them with this fancy 3D imaging camera and we get the recordings out. Mm -hmm. It's kind of making my eyes go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and this is the this is De Martinville's machine here and what would happen is uh, someone would speak into portion C there 
and it would vibrate down the line over there to portion A, and another dude, like his assistant, would crank uh, portion K, and on there was a piece of paper with uh, soot, and it was covered in soot, and this little needle would make a, a little wave carving into it as it was spun, and that would, uh, you know, be, be carved in by the audio that was being spoken into um, the horn. You know, this this reminds me, actually, this is one of the reasons that the xylophone was such a prominent instrument in early recordings, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, is because the the kind of brittleness inherent to the xylophone sound uh, could actually be picked up and heard on recordings, whereas a violin kind of right. turned into mush. Oh, no uh, way. Yeah, yeah, so this is why, you know, like, the Green Brothers were so big in recording is because, honestly, it was one of the few instruments that would work on those, or, you know, that would be really easy to listen to on one of those recordings. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we were talking about the... Like, it's interesting to think of an invention that captured sound in visual form. and But part of... Like, the really sentimental part of me thinks, like, I would love to have a visual representation of, like, my grandparents saying my name or something huh. like that. You know what I mean? So, probably make a million dollars selling those things, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sell them in the uh, Sky Mall catalogs right next to the uh, airline magazine. <laughs> there you go. Well, it's yeah. a it's a, it's another example of um, pe pe people will criticize science and and research if they don't see its direct effect. Mm -hmm. So here, this guy is doing these experiments with sound and the the needle like carving out this thing, and it'd be very easy to say like, well, what are you going to do with that? What's the point of that? How is that going to make allow me to buy a cheaper car? How is that going to fix problems of the world? It's like, well, we don't know yet, but uh, you know, not many years later, and I don't know if this influenced Edison at all. I didn't I didn't run into that, but you can see it's very related. I mean, it's basically half of Edison's recording machine. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, of course, there's, you could trace that back with all our cell phones, computers. There's all these things where when the, when the technology was in its inception, yeah, we didn't know what it was going to be used for, but we supported it and kept doing it. And um, that's why it's frustrating to watch the news and hear people get mad at, <laughs> at, at, science. at science. You know, it's like, no, just support it. You, it's going to pay yeah. off eventually. Who you was know? it? Was it Tesla that predicted the cell phone? Essentially, I think so. I yeah, so, that said yeah. one day there will be these objects that we use to communicate that will have information and yeah. Also just Star Trek, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. Hey, well, I have another question for Mike Burrett. This is a Facebook question from Benjamin Fraley, our buddy Ben Fraley. Um, when you compose a piece, what is the first decision you make? Is it the form, instrumentation, theme, etc.? Uh, so many serious questions here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't think there's not a, there's not a single answer to that question because I don't think I don't think one way necessarily. You know, different pieces start ignite from different sort of you know things. So you know sometimes it's uh, an instrument that I want to write for that I need to write for. Sometimes it's an idea that I had that inspires me. And I use that idea, and I just see where it takes me. I'm not a. I think if I let me see if I can say it right. I am. I am more of a um, bottom up composer than top down, or is it top down? I, I'm not the kind of guy that says, "Okay, here's my grid. I'm gonna fit things into it." You know, mm -hmm. I may start. So maybe it's top down. How does it work? I don't know. Yeah. But I, I may. I may think more like, "Here's my creative energy right now, and let's see where this goes." And then what happens in the course of that for me, I think, is then. I can start to formulate where that's going to go and, and think and think how the, maybe the form's going to work or how it's going to be developed from that point, you know, um, that way more often. So and that's how I live my life, you know. So with that, with that, that Indiana Jones line, I make it up as I go, you know. So I, can't stand, you know? <laughs> I, I have a question to kind of expand on that. I think a, a lot of the time people, people ask our guests, like, how do you start or what's the first thing or something like that. Um, but what I'm curious about is, you know, of course it's, it's probably going to be different every time. How often is it that you have a germ that really does end up expanding into a full piece versus how often do you have a germ that you just kind of end up setting aside and going, no, that idea didn't work, and maybe I'll come back to it later? Well, I don't have enough germs, so I have to use them all. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know. No, it's a good question because I have a couple – I have a little folder of sketches, you know, yeah. of things. So and sometimes I come back to it. 
and use it. And sometimes I come back to it, look at it and go, no, I still can't use it. So I don't know what the percentages are, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think more often I use things than I don't probably, you know, okay. um, but there are a bunch of, there are a few things scrabbling, scrabbling around places that I haven't ever used. And there's pieces that I haven't ever really published that I've written that kind of like hang there that I haven't really put out there. But um, so... Do you have a Do you have like a stack of pieces that haven't even been premiered? Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know about premiered, but like things that I've done on, on a one off thing. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like writing something to fit in somewhere, and then I never. Yeah. Ever, like, never, never, or I'm just also lazy. I have all these pieces I've written for things that that I've used on several occasions. That I just haven't had time to get together to get it. I wouldn't say there. lazy. Well, but you know, yeah, it's just <laughs> not organized enough. So, but you know, it's funny. The interesting thing I remember once I was writing this piece. I can, for um, this piece I wrote in like 09 called Rounders, which is from Rimba and, and Trio. And um, I remember I was trying to get going. I kept coming up with these different ideas. And I went and this is gonna, you're going to love this. It's going to bring this full circle. But I went and saw the first J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie, okay, with my family. And I went to it kind of skeptically thinking, okay, I hope this is going to be okay, you know. And I was just, I just, I was so freaking blown away. I was like, mm. this, this is the greatest thing ever. And the next day I was so excited that I was, <clears throat> I don't know, it was the, the, you know, just seeing the movie and getting excited from the creative energy of the movie. I, I mean, the whole Rounders piece just like exploded. And I just started writing music that got me, and maybe, you know, it was just the energy of the movie. or Maybe some of the music of the movie got me going and I that's in there somewhere. But things like that can happen to kind of move creative energy, which I think is kind of kind of fun to see. I don't know. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense at all, but makes yeah, sense. So. Yeah, it's amazing in movies, and I, I've used movies to explain composition a lot. In fact, in my music appreciation course, um, to demonstrate theme, form, uh, variation, and development, the the Batman movie was new at the time. the The one with Keith uh, Heath Heath Ledger, mm -hmm. Heath Ledger okay. and the Joker. Right, like the really good Batman movie. Why so serious? Right, right that one. So. Right. So I, I, I basically did a formal thematic analysis. Uh, I mean, very you know informal, really, because it's just me doing whatever. But it like tracks through what what he does and all, all the way down to how why Batman gets attacked by dogs in the beginning in the opening fight scene, if you remember, all the way down to why the Joker at the end sticks his head out the window like a dog and like shakes his head as the car is driving. And it's like, yes, there's no arbitrary content at all. And in movies, and I agree that that J.J. Uh, Abrams' Star Trek movie was really good. Um, but it's just so clear, okay, like good writing um, is just so clear when you see it, you know. I mean, and there's so much bad writing that I, I wish people recognized it for a, a composition. Yeah, it's hard to know. Like, you, you, you know it, and you don't know why you know it. Maybe sometimes, right? You do, and then what you did there is try to help us understand why it's good. Because here's here's what happened, and here's why this actually. There, here's reasons why this actually is great, you know. But we don't always see that on first take, you know. There's someone told me once. I remember thinking about this. A guy that was uh, a composer, a friend of mine, um, made the analogy too of a play. And you know, this is, it goes back to the ideas thing. And you just start with ideas. Do you have a form? Well, you have to. There has to be some kind of construct. And he was saying, you know, if you're gonna you know, you, if you're watching a play and someone comes out in the first scene and they have a knife, right? You see the knife. Now, they may have nothing to do with the scene, but there's this knife and it's there and you're like, wow, it's this knife. But then there's the play goes by and the knife never comes back. You're like, what was the deal with the knife? You know? mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, when you're writing a piece, if you have, you can't, you have to be, you have to have some kind of integrity about what was this doing there? And if this was there, there has to be some reason that it was there. And maybe, like you said about the dog and the Joker at the end, how it comes back in a way. Similar kind of thing. So I think that's something that I certainly try and think about that when I'm writing. To think about here's these ideas and here's what am I doing with this? Is there an integrity to how I'm developing it? And if I if I did throw it out there, I better do something with it. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's very it's easy to point out in a movie. I think it's very hard to point out in music. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as as a teacher, I find it's um, even though so much of it is is often there. Hey, well, while we're talking about the screen, um, Megan, <coughs> you were going to talk something about YouTube stars, right? Yeah. So I came across I, I I became fascinated kind of with YouTube stars when there was an article submitted for Rhythm Scene last month um, about a YouTube drummer, YouTube star, and so. I, I just thought it was really interesting. I wanted to look into it a little bit more. And I did, and what I found was that YouTube stars can actually make 
thousands of dollars and can often make mm. more money than people on TV and sometimes in movies. It's insane. So these are three profiles, three quick profiles of um, of people who have done that. Basically, come from just original, ordinary people who have make thousands of dollars off off of YouTube. So uh, one of those is Jenna Marbles, and she's estimated at three hundred fifty thousand or more annually. And she and also each of these people are from the exact same generation. I think that's what's really interesting too. It's just it's it's a very small age group that is just going at this right now. It's crazy. So she was born in '86, and uh, she's an American YouTube personality, vlogger, vlogger. Is that how you say that? I don't even know how to say that. Vlogger. That's a thing, vlogger, right? Vlogger. Yeah. 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 Vlogger. Yeah. Video vlogger. Uh, yeah. Comedian and actress. And her channel has over 15 million subscribers, making it the seventh most subscribed channel on YouTube and the top channel operated by a woman. And so how she did that was that in 2010, she released a video called How to Trick People into Thinking You're Good Looking. Mm. <laughs> and it was viewed over 5.3 million times in its first week. So what she continues to do, and this is also common for all of these stars is that she uploads a new YouTube video, a new video to her YouTube channel every Wednesday or Thursday. So all of these people are consistently posting mm -hmm. on a regular schedule. Um, and that's that's kind of what makes it active, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, second person, Tyler Oakley, estimated up to seven hundred forty four thousand dollars annually off of YouTube. And his his podcast, Psycho Babble, with Corey Cole, and he is currently on CBS's The Amazing Race. Also, his YouTube channel alone makes approximately three hundred seventy-one thousand dollars annually. He was born in '89, so again, kind of the same age. Um, he's American YouTube and podcast personality, humorist, author, and activist. Much of his activism has been dedicated to LGBT youth um, rights, as well as social issues, including healthcare, education, and the prevention of suicide among LGBT youth. Mm -hmm. Again, regularly posts material on various topics, including queer, politics, pop culture, and humor, but he's actively posting things. Third person, Michelle Fon, estimated at $441.4 million annually. Whoa. She's a makeup artist and entrepreneur and who was once denied a job at a makeup counter. Now, thanks to the success of her YouTube channel, she's kicked off a makeup company that's worth $84 million. Her YouTube channel has over 8 million subscribers, 1.1 lifetime views, and 385 uploaded videos. So the even though the numbers are a little bit lower for this drummer, um, it's still pretty impressive. So his name is Casey Cooper, and someone interviewed him in uh, the April issue of Rhythm Scene. He's age 24, he has 800,000 subscribers, 150 million views, and he's produced 800 unique videos spanning many musical styles. And in his interview, he says that he used to spend 16 hours a day on his YouTube channel, wow. uploading videos and sharing it on di in different places and things like that. So an incredible amount of time. It's, it is a full-time job. So and the other thing that I find interesting about this, too, is uh, I was in California last week, and I was happened to be talking to a mutual friend who works for YouTube. And she was telling me that she, what she mainly does is she works, she writes code to help people with their YouTube channels. So yeah. she's kind of like Q and A, um, and is you know she's a computer programmer, so she's writing code to help people with their channels. And but part of her job is that she goes to YouTube conferences. And she said it's it's scary. <laughs> she said it's totally scary. It's like this one age group, and. Um, just totally into it and can make a lot of money off of it. So check out the interview with Casey Cooper in mm -hmm. April Rhythm Scene. But he's got a lot of crazy videos, including one where he lights his drumsticks on fire. Nice. Um, and <laughs> oh, and nice. I, Same. I mean, you know, that's something you have to manage, I would think, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, I, it's, just, it's just different he, than what we do because, you know, we all – record ourselves playing and, and have YouTube channels and, and do things, but I think it's not a priority for us to post every single day or I don't think we're trying to make money off it. So this is just like a different avenue. Can I ask you a question about that? Does YouTube make money yeah. off it? I don't understand how that works. Oh, yes. Yeah. They make money? So you're paying... How, how do they make money off it? How does YouTube the ads. 
I think it's the ads. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sure there must be some kind of split where whoever's uploaded the video, they put the attached the ad to it, and they're getting some kind of cut from that. Mm -hmm. what? Yeah, so the only way these guys are making this astronomical amount of money is because they have so many so many views and so sure. much attention, which is why there's there, there's all this encouragement, like, boost your posts on Facebook and get more likes by doing this and get yeah. more views by doing that. It's all about if people are paying attention. And, yeah, so I, I would love to know what YouTube is making off of. Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say probably equal at, at least that much. <laughs> oh, way more than yeah. way more than equal. I mean, um, I have I have a friend here whose wife, uh, her name is Patty Shugla, and she's I think like the the number one children's music star on YouTube, and she has like the gold plaque from where she had a hundred thousand subscribers or whatever. Um, and yeah, it's like they they have to regularly do this thing, and yeah, it's it's a mm -hmm. lot of pressure to continue to do that. Well, 16 hours a day, yeah. It's, it's... Yeah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. you know, there's no time for Game of Thrones if you're doing that. You're <laughs> That's saying, true. 16 yeah. Hours. Some yeah. of this, you know, I, I got to admit, I do edit the podcast while watching some Game of Thrones or, or some Family <laughs> Guy. Or, <laughs> that, is, that is doable. Casey, how much money are we making off the podcast so far? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, you didn't get your check yet? Dude, your check's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Let's there's check a documentary... Me. Sorry, there is a documentary, too, about YouTube on Netflix, I believe, um, about how it was founded, and it's really interesting. God, that's meta. Documentary about YouTube you on Netflix. Associated with <laughs> you know, I had an interesting story about a, a, one of our videos. Actually, you know the Fandango video? Okay. We did mm -hmm. last year. Actually, I was at PASIC last year, and this came up, and the guy, actually, the University of Rochester put that up. It wasn't even me. They, they're, they're, so it's on their channel. So they kind of monitor it, you know, and someone put another recording over the top of it from another artist, like this jazz oh. person. And so these were going on at the same time as you listen to it. And what we did that then was then put an ad on top of that and claimed that it was that Fandango was actually pirated from them. What? It was, but they were doing it as a scam to make money. Is this, yeah. you know, this is a crazy Someone thing. did that to me. Yeah, one what of my that? videos, someone did that exact thing. They took my recording and barely slowed it down and overlaid it and then said I stole it. Yeah, yeah it's, how crazy oh is that, gosh. right? Yeah, it's nuts. It's like, dude, it's got 600 views. How much? you got to make like <laughs> three <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. Right. Well, the university called me and said, now, did you steal this? I said, what? <laughs> I steal it. <laughs> but then I didn't know it. You know, like, it was so, yeah. But then we, then we figured out this thing was going on. And I think it's resolved. I forget. But it was so bizarre. I've never seen anything like that. Well, yeah, it's weird. well, 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 well that? Someone, took it, someone took it a step further with Blake Tyson and myself. They actually took ripped our audio tracks from YouTube um, and produced their own CD and published it and and copyrighted it with CD Baby. And then YouTube's nice. audio detection system picked it up and flagged, wow. Blake, flagged Blake and I for violating copyright. That's fantastic. And, That's great that yeah. they found it. Well, yeah, sure, but it's interesting because we didn't have any type of formal copyright on our videos, but this person had formal copyright because they took them and and went through CD Baby and got like a, you know, the did the whole like official thing. So it, it, it all worked out. Wow. I think Blake actually did most of the work, but we were both like talking mm -hmm. to their legal department and trying to sort it out and, and it all, it all's fine and went away. But that, that was this person's, that was their, that was their racket. They, they ripped YouTube recordings, mm -hmm. called them something else and made these big long CD collections of authentic Yeah, you're supposed music. to call like... It was like automatic, gua uh, authentic Guatemala, Guatemalan marimba music or something yeah, like that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they had, they had another track that, yeah. that said like, like Cambodian pan flute and it was... <laughs> 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 yeah, it was it it was like it was like banjo harmonica playing, and it was it said it was Korean pan flute yeah, or something. It was, so it was it was very interesting that they, they the, the ones they chose to pirate yeah. were like Blake Tyson's most popular video. It was like his super. Right. Super it. It's just interesting. It's like hey, if you're gonna do something sneaky like that, why don't you just take something that nobody will will recognize? You know. Mm -hmm. uh, but but they took our our. Each of our like more popular videos. Um, I what came up for them first when they were searching for the material, maybe because they had I, so many. Yeah, I, I guess, guess, but it's like, damn, dude, take ten more seconds and like 
pick something that uh, it's just amazing. It's just you know it's interesting that this is sort of off topic, similar. I I found a uh, there's a recording and I won't tell you what it is, but it's actually sold on iTunes of actually Rounders, which is funny. But it's the mm. MIDI. There was, I had a MIDI version made by someone of this piece, and so I, I someone say, oh, they, I see there's a recording of Rounders from this group, and they're actually from Japan, and I. Well, so I bought it. I said, oh, you know, I bought it, and it's, it's my MIDI <laughs> on their CD of the piece. Uh, wow. Whoa. They're selling it. Isn't this fantastic, it's right? So what do but you do? I, don't, I haven't done anything. I don't know what to do right yeah. now. But, you know, because it's, you know, it's in Japan. It's hard to know how to deal with that. But it's just shocking to me. This stuff goes on. It's like, yeah. you know, wow, you know. Well, so. it's, shocking. it's shocking to know that people will do something that underhanded for what? Like, how much money are you going to make? Yeah, like, right. there isn't. There isn't enough money in this in this little contemporary percussion thing to even I don't know uh, uh, yeah it's it's really weird to think yeah no it, it is you think out of the respect for each other and that we're all trying to we're all trying to do the same kind of thing that we would not you know, do that to each other <laughs> you know? exactly exactly right. yeah yeah I, also you know, the concept of the YouTube star is is totally different you know it doesn't really fit our genre because we're not looking to be discovered or you know, make millions of dollars. So well, we speak do, for yourself. You know, there might be something, <laughs> <laughs> there might be something that goes viral in our community, but it's generally more of a niche, right? It's a sharing concept. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Versus yeah. this, you know, because, and not to say that the YouTube stars aren't talented and that they're putting out right. entertaining videos or something, because I'm sure it's great, but, um, you know, their concept of, of, spending 16 hours a day, of posting every single day. Um, when you look at the content versus some other people that aren't doing that but put up very high-quality videos or what we do, you know, also, uh, I don't know, it's just different. It's just a different thing. Sure. It's weird. Yeah, um, yeah it reminds me of what, uh, I mean, Casey talks about, like, whatever you do 12 to 16 hours a day is what you're going to be good at. It's, you know, that's what you're going to yeah. make it on. So right. you know, it can be practicing marimba or it can be YouTube. Totally. Yeah. Well, I love that. I love that this YouTube star thing is a possibility because finally the I don't know people are choosing what's popular. It's That's like true. you know, and also all this homemade household recording stuff that you can do. It's so wonderful that you can do that. It's like no longer is the the you know guy in a tux and a suit with a big cigar going rolling up in a limo going. I liked your show, kid. I, let me see what you got. Like that's just dying. <laughs> Like, like that should be gone. Like I'm gonna make a star out of you. That should just be gone. You know that's dumb. Like we shouldn't be told what to like anymore. We should choose what we like, and it's yeah. just it, it's nice that these people can with hard work, um, yeah, like achieve that. It's really cool. Yeah. Well, the flip side though is then you you see what actually gets popular, and you're like, ah, oh, man. <laughs> you know, it's like when TLC went from whatever, like public or something, to being a different kind of channel, that's when they started to put on crap like Honey Boo Boo. Well, what about the History Channel? And the History Channel is all a alien, uh, Egypt Egyptian aliens. and Yeah, ancient and, aliens. And thanks thank Thanksgiving aliens and <laughs> stuff. Egyptian yeah. aliens. Well, those yeah. are the most interesting kinds of aliens, really. You know, if you think about the Thanksgiving ones. The Thanksgiving ones, <laughs> the big hats with the buckles. The pilg pilgrim aliens, yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, yeah. <laughs> let's let's ask Mike another question. I like this one from Mika. Um, how do you approach? Maybe Mika. Oh, Mika. Thanks. Um, how do you approach name? learning a big piece like a Vinyal solo for the first time? I start uh, start by crying when I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> <Didn't that>? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's there's no magic for me. It's it's. Uh, um, I think. Uh, it's it's in, in a sense formed a lake, but it's like I, it's like building a, a house or something. I start oftentimes I'll start at the beginning, and maybe sometimes with, with those pieces, like maybe some of the earlier parts of the piece aren't as necessarily difficult to learn, so I won't spend as much time there. I'll I'll kind of move into like maybe I remember when I learned conversations, I think I started with the third variation, maybe and started digging in there. But metronome work and build it and just learn a variation at a time. And I was very strict about. Um, staying with a metronome and keeping it very slow um, until I could really play the whole piece at one tempo or in one sort of tempo relationship. So not necessarily learning one variation and getting it up to tempo and then learning another or kind of constructing it um, that way in a very disciplined way. So I felt like I understood how this all built as a piece. Um, and um, 
Yeah, and then you know, stay with that discipline um, in that way. Pieces like that, though, like the Vignal pieces, I always memorize from the beginning. I'm not reading them and then sort of memorizing them as I play it a lot. It sort of becomes osmosis. I don't like that. I don't think I memorize truly memorize well that way. I can, it's more intentional memorization with, with that kind of thing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know. But I think you start. You look through the piece. You see what you're what you're into. What's 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 going to happen with this piece? How's it going to go? And then, okay, I'm going to start here and start learning, you know. Um, certain other pieces, um, I'll tell students if they're learning the Druckmann, and they're going to learn the whole piece. I may, I may tell them, okay, I want you to learn the first movement so you can sort of get a sense of what the language is, but then I want you to learn the fourth movement. Because I think that's the, that's the movement that you need to have in your hands the longest. Mm -hmm. So let's learn that first, and then go back, if that makes sense. You know, see, yeah. I think sometimes that can be um, a good way to go. I don't like it often because I kind of – like to see how I learn a piece in the way that it's going to unfold because I think that informs me more about the piece intuitively than sort of learning here and going back and forth different sections. But sometimes mm -hmm. that can be valuable. So, but I think a lot of slow practice and being very disciplined in that and sort of you know uh, taking your time in that way. So. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, I would I'd like to move to another Facebook question actually from Ted Jackson. He says. Uh, could you explain how important your mentors were to you and why and how you tried to act like them toward your students? Gordon Stout, Herbert Flower, John Beck, and Paul Yanchich. <laughs> uh, well, uh, how important. Well, first of all, Gordon Stout was great because um, I went to Ithaca for my first two years of schooling before I, I ended up transferring to Eastman as an undergrad. And it was his first year at Ithaca. And um, I was kind of a drum set guy. Going into college, you know, I had a sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but real quick, at, at that point was was Gordon Stout, who we know Gordon Stout today, or was well, he? I mean, it's, it's, different. it's hard to compare that, right? Because we don't have. I mean, I knew Gordon Stout because I lived close. I lived a couple hours from Eastman, and I knew some of what was going on there. And I had actually, as a as a ninth grader, went to the very first Pasig in Eastman in 1976. So, I kind of knew in that way, but I don't think Gordon Stout was no, you know. Because of our uh, social media and what we have now, people are known in a different way than they were back then. We yeah. had percussive notes. And so within our field, we knew that he was an exciting young player who was writing music for the marimba that was sort of this instrument the marimba was having a resurgence, you know, of sorts in the, in the, in the early, in the mid-70s. And this is like 1980. So, um, but I played keyboard percussion when I was in high school because my dad made me. He's a band director. He said, you have, to, you have to play marimba. And I was like, I don't want to. I want to be a drummer. And so I did because I had to, and I, I didn't love it. I wasn't spending 16 hours a day on it. But when I went to Ithaca and met Gordon and saw what he did, saw the paradigm of this guy who was this performer, composer, teacher, I really sort of loved, I loved that. I thought that was really, really fascinating to me. And his musicianship at the instrument really inspired me. So in that way, um, it was huge for me because I think it gave me a paradigm. It's almost like you go to college thinking you're going to do one thing and then then all of a sudden you learn all this new stuff and it changes everything for you. So for me, that was big. And then I think at Eastman with John Beck, um, the well-roundedness and uh, sort of uh, I grew to love and gain a passion for orchestral percussion. And, um, and he's a true professional. So I think I learned a lot about, I know I learned a lot about professionalism and integrity um, both musically and personally from, from JB as well. So, you know, uh, for sure. I don't know if that, you know, gives you enough answers there, but, you know, those are some of the ones. And, you know, everyone has a different piece they play in your life, you know. Yancha was just a great tip in this, and he gave me a different way of thinking musically. Um, and Herb Flowers, my high school teacher, who was a super committed guy, beautiful musician, played for years in the Syracuse Symphony. And uh, I always remember when I, he, had, he taught me formalis, but he taught me cross stick. And um, to play the, to play, uh, the uh, William Kraft French Suite Sarabat movement, which was like, you know, this formal drum thing. I'm, so I was learning it that way. And I, you know, I went home, didn't practice for a few days, and I, I couldn't remember how to hold the sticks. Well, my father made me go see a Lee Stevens clinic in 1977. And I was like in high school. I was a 10th grader. And I, I didn't want to go. But I sat in the back of the band room. And Lee says, I'm going to show you how to hold my formal grip. And I thought, good, because I forgot how. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, no gosh. joke. I thought I forgot how to do this. So, That's and the, so and they passed out those mustard fiberglass two step mallets and I picked them up and they had like Lee was passing out like the first three pages of his book at that time was a mustard educational handout. And I 
All right, so then I go home and I like sort of okay, I'm holding the Stevens grip. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I don't know that it's any different because I don't remember. So I learned the French suite playing the Stevens grip, and I go to her. We go to my lesson, you know, and I always remember my lesson to her flower. He's always eating breakfast. In the lesson. Oh man, bacon was horrible. Because you know you're like trying to play and you're smelling bacon. You're trying, but anyways, I remember playing French suite, and he's like, he stopped eating his bacon. He's like, what are you doing? I said. This is the movement you told me to learn, right? Yeah, but how are you holding the sticks? And I'm like, uh, like you showed me? He goes, I don't think so. So he goes over, and then we spent, we probably spent five or ten minutes, me showing him how to hold the sticks. Whoa. What are you doing? I'm doing this. I don't know what I'm doing. So that was interesting. But Herb was great. He was excited about that. He got, he was the kind of guy that was like, this is great. I love this. Oh, so wow. That's, that's cool. crazy. So, have you ever forgotten how to hold the mallet since? <laughs> yeah. Every day I forget. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I, I'm curious because I'm sure we both get this question a lot. How do you? And, and I'm, I'm guessing we we all kind of feel the same about this. Um, so I'm I'm wondering how you shut this question down in a clinic or or what you do with it. Maybe you use it to make a point or something. But which grip is the best? Uh, <laughs> you know, w w why should you play one grip versus another? How do you, I, I'm sure you've gotten that a lot. What do, what do you do with that question when a kid throws it up? Yeah, I guess it's funny. I don't get as many of those. Um, I think, you know, a while ago, Casey, um, 20 years ago, I got more of those questions. You know what I mean? Because when I was younger, and I kind of grew up at a time when I was in college, um, I was probably 10 years after Lee and Gordon Rudy Smith, but it was still kind of this thing, like, you know, that the Stevens group was still like, you know, which, 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 what do you do? Which one's better? What are you doing this for? And um, But I don't get that as much anymore. And I think, you know, I've always been the kind of guy that um, – I think usually I, I, you know, I, um, I say, you know, if if, uh, if someone comes to my concert and says, wow, look at he's using that grip, I feel like they're listening to the wrong kind of things or they're not paying attention to what's important. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. And, and I answer it. I say, though, I should probably come up with that kind of answer for it. And, um, you know, and I don't, you know, I don't give it much time, I guess. If do you feel like, time. do you feel like maybe also, since we're talking about YouTube earlier, do you think younger players have a better perspective of being able to see videos of Kashka or, or you or Gordon Stout or something on YouTube and they can see that it, like all these grips work in a sense? Sure, I think, and I also just think it's what you're comfortable with. and you, you, you learn to make, I think the bottom line is this. It's like if you watch anyone's snare drum grip, whether it be traditional or matched, you know, there are certain idiosyncrasies and certain there are certain things that need to work for it to work. But then there are subtleties and physiology things that we all have that make it all different, you know. Um, and so, uh, but you learn to do it, and then your ears help, help your hands find a way to make the music you want to make. And I think that is so true with, with formal grips. Like, your ears are the ones that direct what you do. And, and your, your grip is really just a facilitator towards that. And I think, you know, really terrific musicians find a way through what they're comfortable with, you know, through whatever their uh, facility is to create the music. And so you get comfortable with the straight. So, you know, when I play vibes, I play Steven's grip just because I do it all the time and it feels comfortable or multiple percussion. I have students that go back and forth and that's fine. I want to play, I play vibes. I'm going to go to Burton. I go to, remember I play Stevens. If I plan playing multiple percussion, I'm trying to play Zaffa. I'm going to use acrostic grip. That's who they are. And I play, when I play orchestral snare drum, I play a match grip. When I play drum set, I play traditional grip because I started that way. And uh, do I think one's better than the other? Well, I think for me, this feels right. And that's that's the language of my hands. You know what I'm saying? And that's how my hands work. And so I think we as creatures of adaption, we learn whatever we learn. And probably what we've learned the longest is what we feel at home at. And then we go. And if you're a good musician, you're going to make good sounds and make good music through however you're holding those sticks, you know? Hey, uh, Ben, I'm looking at the clock, and you have a lesson to teach, so... Yes, I've got to run. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it was so nice to, to meet you again, Michael. Yeah, nice talking to you. And I'll Bye, see Ben. You guys next week. See ya. See ya. Thanks, Ben. See you, buddy. Yeah, yeah it, al it always seems like such a big issue, and sometimes I just want to go, man, do you think bass players sit around going like, well, German versus French, which is better? <laughs> no, if they, if they heard oh. some of the conversations that people have about these grips they would just say like wow when do you guys like do you guys ever talk about music or you know? well, yeah, I think it, also, it also shows the infancy of our craft a little bit you know it shows the youngness of That's what we're true. doing right I mean so um, you know and so there's it, there's kind of I've always think of it this way case I always think it was kind of a there's a good and bad that I think it's kind of exciting I feel really fortunate that I lived and have grown up and have been you know, a student and professional during this time to see what 
what our field does to see it grow. It's kind of fun to be a part of that. But yeah. you know, I'm you know, <clears throat> and and but there are there are the downside is that sometimes we get lost in the minutiae of things that don't matter. <laughs> you know, in you know the big picture. So. Yeah, I really like what you said about the language of your hands because I, I write about this kind of stuff a lot, and I always think like the choice of grip is your body's going to tell you if you're playing the right one. Right, right. You yeah, know, for sure. Um, yeah, and sometimes what you're taught first, it doesn't fit your body as well as this next one that you learned, and play the next one because it makes your hands happy. What's the problem? Mm -hmm. You know, right. no, I'm absolutely right. It's just it's totally true. And I have students that sometimes come to me and want to switch to learn what I'm doing. Uh, mm -hmm. and some that try and it doesn't work and I'm okay with that. You know, I'm not trying to make everyone, you're not trying to clone people anyways. <laughs> you know, it's like here, let's, let's help you to achieve what, what's, you know, what's going to work best for you. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, kind of live and let live, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, this is, um, right on track with another Facebook question. Uh, Will Marinelli says, what have been some of the most significant changes you've seen um, developing in percussion and pedagogical fields in the last decade or so. Wow, I know very serious. That's a big very, question. Very serious question. Ask, ask that question again, because my small mind and the lack of coffee is, you know, it's making. Yeah, I think I might have read it poorly too. Let's see. What have been some of the most significant changes you've seen develop in the percussion pedagogical fields in the last decade or so? In the last decade. Okay, so decades, if I, if I have this right, is 10 years, right? That's Just correct. so I'm thinking the right That's way. Correct. 10 years, okay. It would have been sweet if he asked millenniums or something. Yeah, that would have been interesting. Wow. That he the would last have been really eon. Old, you know what I'm saying to you? <laughs> 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 I mean, Mike Burry could give us a millennial answer. Um, let's see. Um, I would say uh, the last 10 years. I think certainly multimedia. I mean, the biggest things is that our ability to communicate pedagogy uh, more readily, right, through the Facebook stuff and through YouTube and um we can learn about it quicker. You can, um, you can, like you said, you can see a variety of artists playing different grips, playing different repertoire. You can learn about repertoire quickly. Um, so uh, there's an accessibility to learning that I certainly never had, and I've only seen blow up, which is fascinating mm -hmm. to me. So, and I think pedagogically, we're I think we're still learning how to use it in a really great way, so that we can, you know, because you know, still I think. To me, there's nothing. Nothing replicates the one-on-one -on -one lesson, a live lesson. You know, a Skype lesson is one thing, but you have to be in the room and the, the, you know, the tactile aspects of teaching someone. I don't think you can ever. I maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we're wrong, but you can't ever really um, replicate that, right? But or usurp that. But uh, certainly, you know. And I've done. I just did some videos for Eastman. We're doing a project, and I did some videos on things for marimba and snare drum technique that haven't come out yet. We're working through. Um, that I think will hopefully be helpful and kind of, you know, um, compendium material to people's learning and even like another perspective. Well, how does this person do this? Or how does this person do this? And you can watch them do it and hear them talk about it and, and learn about it uh, readily that way. So mm -hmm. I think it's great. It's a, it's a, it's gonna be, it's a great resource that we didn't used to have. So that's probably maybe the biggest change by the guys. I don't think we've had any like huge technical changes um, and how we approach things. And I think also maybe the instruments, you know, there's, we're still evolving. I mean, obviously I was involved in designing a marimba, but you see these new different kinds of marimbas coming out. Still, we're still trying to decide on the size of the, of the bars and hopefully we're getting closer to getting a, a sense of that. Um, but just advancements, even in the way tippany are made and things that they're doing, like the duff drums with the hydraulic pedals, as opposed to using the old, you know, ratchet mm -hmm. um, things and th things of that nature. Are interesting. I think we're always evolving sticks and mallets and, and uh, maybe the most important is repertoire because yeah. we have more repertoire. I think we have better repertoire. I mean, when I was a kid, one of the things I, I talk about a lot, and I think it struck me, it's just been striking me more recently, these kind of things, you know, um, that, you know, the great thing is that we have, you know, we have pieces by Schwant and we have pieces by Druckmann and we have pieces, you know, <clears throat> by Pulitzer Prize winning composers that are written for us now, as well as pieces by people like Casey and Pius and, you know, myself and, the, the, you know that we're sort of generating music within our field which i think is important too it's exciting and but one of the things that's challenging and i think especially when i grew up i grew up learning like muster a to janelle off to the rain and then i learned the fishinger suite and that seemed like big which i still think is a great piece but you know it seemed big and then when i was a grad student you know i had the manuscript to, to variations on lost love hmm. i was like okay i'm gonna learn this and no one else had learned that before and he's like man mike that's like that's like 
13 minutes long. I said, I know. Wow. You know, so it was like, you know, I remember learning that piece and I thought, wow, I, you know, and I think it's interesting because now we're playing bigger pieces. Pianists kind of grow up. If you're a serious pianist, if you're a kid taking piano lessons at a young age, you're playing pretty sophisticated music and sometimes with some girth of time. And in terms of, you know, if you're learning a big Beethoven song, you're learning something that's, you know, yeah, it's, it's a long, you know, and, 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 but we don't start that way. And all of a sudden we learn these sort of little pieces and then intermediate pieces. And I think it's still true. We're better than we were. But then all of a sudden, boom, here's kind of variations. Okay. Wow. And we're not trained to understand what it's like either from a, you know, a sophistication standpoint musically, or even from a concentration standpoint, even more so to know how to concentrate for 10 minutes of difficult music or know how to concentrate for 20 minutes of a difficult piece or because that's not something that's in our repertoire and maybe further our, pedag our pedagogy. Yeah, we, yeah. And so I think it's challenging for some people can do it and they're okay. But most of the time, I think for most of my students and I have pretty exceptional students, it's still challenging mm -hmm. because it's not something that we do at a young age in our pedagogy. And that's something I think we need to work on mm -hmm. to find a way so that that transition into that music, which is always going to be harder maybe than other music, of course, because it is complicated music, some of it, but just the idea of developing that strength in who we are as artists in our field is something through repertoire and whatever <clears throat> pedagogy that we, I think we need to work on next. So hmm. there's a long answer. Sorry. You know. No, that's, no, that's, that's a great answer. It, it seems like, uh, percussionists in in, uh, in in one area of this haven't quite come to a consensus as to what a percussionist is supposed to be and mm -hmm. then musicians at large definitely haven't come to a consensus as to what a percussionist is supposed to be and uh, the, the example I, I, I like to cite talking to people about job interviews or like college teaching job interviews and they'll they'll say um, you know oh the committee was bummed out that I didn't play any drum set um, or th this this guy on the committee wanted to hear uh, wondered why I played so much marimba this person wondered why they didn't play any vibes and it's like okay uh, so so like what are we right. supposed to do like what do you what do you want and of course the, the it's like running for it's like running for president you know who can I gotta keep all these constituencies happy yeah. right yeah. and of course the yeah. right the right thing for them to do would be well we want to hear this 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 and that but it seems after many people I've talked to that. It, they don't always do that, you know. They they end up saying like, "Oh yeah, well, I just don't know why the the candidate didn't play anything from the wind symphony repertoire, from the band repertoire." <sighs> like, well, they probably didn't know to because mm -hmm. you didn't write you didn't it say. down. You so, also just said play for forty minutes. Right. Right. Yeah. But but they all have their idea of what a percussionist should be, yeah. and 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 of course, my answer to to them, well, why didn't you play any any. Uh, hand percussion. It's like, well, I also didn't play any steel pan. I didn't play any drum set. I didn't play any um, authentic castanet. I didn't. You know, it's like percussion is so huge, and it yeah, would be it really is. nice if percussionists would come to a consensus as to what we're supposed to be, and the world, the world would as well. But um, I feel like you're about to, or going back to your previous comment, it is really fun being in that time while that is developing, and it is a lot more interesting now than probably if all that was in place and developed. Um, and it's so cool too because I think you there's so much space to be a unique person. You right. know, I think I kind of hope yeah. that the job interview doesn't end up becoming too standard because you can go in and say, this is me, like and this is you know, this is what I have to say and this is a new instrument or something or this is um, how I like to use my voice. And I think if everyone was playing the standard repertoire it would be boring. <laughs> Or the same way, or yeah, or has the same. Yeah, I think it's great that we, as percussionists, I think it's you know, great that we can have different areas of emphasis or different areas of interest or different areas that we just you know are simply excel at, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a it's a great thing. And you know, my daughter, who's a creative writer, she's actually I'm gonna go see her today, but she's um getting her master's MFA in creative writing at Washington University. She's a brilliant writer. And, and it was interesting when she was applying for grad schools. It was interesting for me. I've learned a lot from watching her in her field and, and the parallels. Yeah. But sometimes we get worried about, but they're not worried about the English field. Like, you know, well, if I'm applying to Brown, their creative writing program is leans this way and it's a little more avant-garde and this and this. But if I go to Madison, it tends to be more traditional and these guys are teaching there so you get this. But if I go here and there's all these different sort of I don't want to say constituencies, but sort of leanings and specialties or just here's who we are 
and here's what we do and we're comfortable with it. You mm -hmm. know, and I think we need to sort of get there, you know, because if you go to Eastman, you're going to get something different than if you go to New England Conservatory or if you go to a James Madison University, it's different than if you go to, you know, University of Virginia or, I mean, it's, it's and that's okay. You know, yeah. I mean, there are certain thing fundamentals that we all teach are certain parts of, you know, but I think we should be comfortable with that and then be happy that we have different identities because that actually I think makes it stronger I think yeah. you know and helps the field grow better if we minimize it and try to make it like here's what it's supposed to be then we're going to like you know there'll be a glass ceiling on everything you know, so. well and I think mm -hmm. I think we percussionists are very happy about it but yeah. you, you run into so many so many people that are like why are you guys playing all this marimba all the time why aren't you there's no where's the rep there's tell, no rep tell with that God's anymore. instrument and they need to get to figure that out you know that's the, that's the point <laughs> oh, right. I agree I think it's their problem <laughs> Sure. I, I definitely think it's it's their bad and they need to like figure figure this out you know of course um, well that's our job to kind of help educate them and hopefully as time moves forward the leaders in the field and um will help them to understand that it's kind of our job to help them understand that i think you know i think so you know yeah. so through what we do and our actions what our students do so um, yeah hey well you know, Mike, what do you have coming up? Do you have anything? Uh, you said you made some recordings that are about to come out, uh, educational oh, recordings for Eastern. Right, like, like today, I have a drive today. I'm going to go have a nice dinner in St. Louis. But uh, beyond that, let's see. Um, uh, I have, we just finished at Eastman, uh, a Vignal recording. of uh, I had recorded already con variations and then bird variations, a solo piece. I recorded last summer Estudios de Frontera, which is the um, quintet, you know, um, it's kind of a solo remember with quintet, but it's really kind of integrated with uh, third coast percussion. And then Eastman recorded uh, this new sextet that we commissioned that we played at PASIC about three years ago called the Water Sextet. Actually, Megan was on that when we premiered it. Um, really beautiful piece. Uh, it's about a 23 or four minute work in three movements mm -hmm. percussion sextet, you know, pianist with it. So we just finished recording that this week. And so I'm hoping in the next year or six months, even, we're going to come out with this big volume of Vignal music. I'll play some solo pieces with Third Coast and Eastman Percussion Ensemble. So that's um, kind of fun to see that happen. I'm excited about that. And hopefully that could be a, a nice resource for people in our field. And then uh, just writing pieces, you know, still I got a little solo piece I'm working on right now, kind of tinkling around with. And um, a concerto I recorded with the Eastman Wind Ensemble should be coming out next year with a video of it as well. That I think you're on that recording yeah. too, right? Um, yeah. And in the summer, do you have any exciting plans for the summer? Uh, yeah, the usual suspects. Stephen Seminar, Chosen Vale, um, teaching in Chautauqua, going to Bulgaria actually for a nice um, uh, marimba uh, festival they have over there. Vasilina Serapanova. I don't know if you know Vasi. Do you know Vasi? She's a beautiful. Um, woman. I, she, I, if it's the same Vasilina that I'm that I'm thinking of, uh, plays my a piece of mine called Bad Touch. Yeah. Yeah. So. She's I haven't met her, but oh, she's great. You'd love her. She's a great person, great family. Her dad runs a really neat. It's kind of like a high school, but it's like a percussion special. It's like a, it's almost like a, I guess like a prep music school up in this little city called Pleven, and nice little facility. Great young Bulgarian percussionists up there, and actually Svet studied with him, and you know, um, mm. so it's kind of neat. So I'm gonna go there this summer. Yeah. Cool. If there is a cool. because because I know we have a lot of listeners that are really into your solo marimba works. Are there any solo marimba works of yours that you would recommend people look at that maybe don't get played as often? Thank you, Casey. This is good because I could use some more sales, so I need to. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I know I'm just great. Uh, I don't know. You know, actually, one of my favorite pieces that I've written that. Probably doesn't get played as much. Is a piece called the Fermo. Actually, it's a short little oh, yeah. piece, but I like it. It's um, I wrote it uh, after I visited Fermo, Italy, and it's and actually it's dedicated to Marta Clemasara. Uh, mm -hmm. And she wouldn't let me play it when I wrote it. She's like, "I'm playing it first. <laughs> so okay. Uh, but um, that's kind of a pretty piece. I don't know. I I don't think about that so much. It's interesting. Um, uh, gosh, what, what what do I want people to play that they don't think about? That that's one maybe. Um, uh, I'd love to see my marimba quartet get played more, because um, yeah. I'm proud of that piece. The new one or the no? Well, 180 is kind of fun, but yeah. there's one that I wrote back in I think 2002 for the PASIC convention. I'm always proud because I wrote that, and in that quartet, I wrote it for four people that were at Northwestern at the time. That were in that group. It was Brett Dietz, Matt Coley, hmm. uh, Clay Condon, and Chris, Chris Keaton. 
I don't know if you know, you know Chris at all, but he. Um, I know the I know the the other uh, three names yeah. at least. But yeah, they were all great. So I wrote that piece for them at the time. That's but, awesome. Uh, it's a fun it's piece. A good group. So, but yeah, I mean, you know, so. so. Well, man, this is so cool. At percussion has Michael Burrett on. And <laughs> it's great. For I appreciate it. This is so cool that you guys do this. I love this. Thanks. Oh, thanks a lot. You know, you know, we had Vinyao on. I'm sure Megan's told you some of that. I heard about that. Was that? But he, he, uh, I love him. But he can talk, huh? He goes on, right? Well, it's great. He can. Oh, it was wonderful. He was, yeah. He was really substantive, and yeah, yeah it was. It was He's great. A very articulate, smart person. But don't drive with him because he gets lost often. <laughs> yeah he's brilliant you know he's like he's got this brilliance and then alejandro can be in the car driving and you you know yeah it's kind of funny to see that, 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 that sort of, uh, this is really good because we've had game of thrones and we've had we had breaking bad was the the yeah. the, the tv show with uh, alejandro oh really he's watching i didn't know he was into that okay yeah he's into breaking bad so <laughs> i remember when we were on our way to pasic though we were sharing a hotel room and one of my favorite stories is i'm getting dressed he's in the shower singing my fair lady <laughs> Okay, <laughs> not the kind of thing you expect Vinyal to be singing in the shower, but he was. You know, in, nice, oh, nice intonation. It was good. It was, you know, yeah. I would have expected something a little more squeak. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. 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 well, <laughs> and hey, Megan, thanks so much for, yeah. for the, the great snag and uh, guest uh -huh. of Mike Burrett. Yeah. Yeah, and Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Well, That's great. Thanks for having me. You guys be well, huh? Oh, yeah, likewise. Yeah, you, you too. too. Safe travels. Thank you. Take care. Yep. Enjoy your dinner in St. Louis. See you guys. <laughs> <laughs>